Oh, I'm sorry, that was awkward. I thought the robot was going to give the presentation. One second. Oh, there we go. Great. So, my job over the next 18 minutes is going to be to create a sense of profound wonder. I'm going to show you some of the stunning possibilities from thinking machines and also give you one concrete example of how intelligent devices can do really good things for society right now and also in the years to come. And as you can probably see from my slide back there, the example I'm going to give you is the example of intelligent artificial limbs. By that, I mean limbs that learn about the people using them and improve through daily life. So before I do any of that, though, I think I have a, uh, a shocking thing to admit. This may shock and horrify many of the tech savvy in the audience, but I don't own a smartphone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I have one of those old-fashioned flip phones, you know, the kind you flip open, they, they send, they, they make and receive calls, if I remember to turn it on. So... This may sound like a really surprising way to start out a presentation on things like, you know, intelligent artificial limbs and high-tech next-generation machine learning, but maybe it's not actually as surprising as it seems. So let me suggest one reason, maybe not the true reason, but one reason why I don't have a smartphone. Maybe I'm holding out for the real thing. Well, okay, so don't get me wrong, smartphones can do a lot of really, really impressive and sometimes miraculous things. So on last weekend, I was playing with my, my father-in-law's iPhone, and I could just talk to it, and it would do things like send a text message, or uh, in, in some cases, I, I was like, okay, well, tell me the square root of 729 in hexadecimal, and, and it did. It, it's 1B for any of those who are wondering. So, I mean, that's not bad. In fact, that's pretty spectacular. There's apps to do almost anything, and there's new apps being made every single day. The only thing is I have to invest some of myself in learning how to use them. And so this is a key point that I'm, I'm hoping to leave you with by the end of our time together today, and that is that there is a very critical, important difference between machines which can do a vast number of things and machines which we can easily control to do a vast number of things. So that's the direction I'm going to head in our little tour of the digital world. I'm going to talk about managing these complex relationships between humans and machines, and also how we can get these machines to adapt to users like you and I. So one great example of this kind of situation is artificial limbs, or prostheses. And so by that I mean uh, artificial or robotic devices which restore function that's lost due to things like injury or illness. Um, so you can imagine a very simple prosthesis. Um, my mother just went in the hospital this week for a, for a hip replacement. Now she's got a nice piece of oxinium connecting her hip to her leg. Uh, that's a very simple prosthesis. On the other end of the spectrum is, is something a bit more complex, a robotic system. It's powered, it's electronic. And uh, a great example is, a very simple example, is the system we have right here today. So you can see I'm, I'm hooked up to my little friend here, and I'm hooked up through uh, a series of electrodes. So they're stuck on my skin, and they record signals from deep in my muscles. Those signals are transmitted through some electronical amplifying equipment to the, uh, to the computer, and the computer then transforms these into signals that move this little simple robotic limb. So that's one, one very simple example, and that's more or less how things work for commercial powered prostheses. So if you have, you can buy robotic prostheses, and uh, this is more or less how they work, and they've done wonderful things. So commercial prostheses have made incredible gains in quality of life for amputees. And I, can't, I don't think I can convey today just how magical it is to watch, a, uh, to watch an amputee actuating one of these robotic limbs. It, it feels like something out of the future. Now, while they have made some great gains, there's still, still limitations to, to what we conventionally have in the prosthetics market. Um, in fact, a lot of amputees find the control of a joint or a, of a robotic limb that has more than, more than one joint, so you know, maybe a wrist and an elbow, hand and an elbow, kind of like what we have here, they find it actually quite complex to control. In some cases, it's frustrating and it's very non-intuitive. Um, this leads to large rejection rates. People stop using their powered prostheses and go back to a mechanical arm. So why is that? I'm going to suggest two reasons today why this might be the case. One is that current systems don't scale up to the case where you have really complex, important new limbs. So imagine you have, I have four sensors here, imagine you had 10,000 sensors. Imagine instead of a little like two-joint arm like I'm showing you here, imagine it was like a big octopus arm, you know, it can move in 58 different dimensions. So 
trying to control that is very challenging, and it's not easy to design a control system which would be able to let it make that easy for a human. Now, the second reason I'm going to, I'm going to pose is that current limb systems don't adapt. They don't change over time. And in fact, the human has to learn a lot about the limb instead of the other way around. Remember my dilemma with the smartphone? I have to learn about all those options. So I'm going to pose something else. I'm going to recast this and say, OK, in the conventional setting, an artificial limb will be, uh, the amputee will be learning about the device. The human will be learning about the machine. And the machine keeps doing, you know, more or less exactly what it's always been doing. You could tw tweak the parameters a little, but for the most part, it keeps doing just the same thing. That doesn't seem a lot like teamwork. That's not collaboration. So why don't we make it a collaboration? Why don't we let the limb learn about the amputee? Well, this sounds exciting. So it could keep changing. It could keep growing. Hey, that sounds great. And you know what? You may say, well, well let's do that right now. And some people have. So some of what I would consider the best ways to control these, these new next generation artificial limbs actually involve machine learning. You'll, the system, the limb, will, will train. Like in the classroom, it, it, maybe in the clinic, or, or maybe at the beginning of each day, the amputee can work with the limb to sort of, you know, adjust it for that day's use. So this is really exciting. But I say, why don't we go farther? Let's do more. Let's let the limb keep learning. You know what? Why can't it just keep learning, keep changing, keep adapting as its user changes, adapts, and, and develops new challenges, new goals, and, uh, and new ways of life. So let's let the limb keep learning. This is a really exciting idea. I'm just going to give you one or two really quick examples of what that might look like. So imagine that you're an amputee, you're using an artificial limb, and you like to cook. Maybe it's Thursday night, and you're cooking tomato bisque. And your limb, you know what? Your limb knows, hey, hey, it's Thursday. And every other Thursday, we've done some really cool cooking. And so, you know, maybe it's, better at, maybe it's better at chopping. Maybe it's better at stirring. It adjusts itself slightly based on its knowledge of you to be able to better do the things you need to do and extend this to anything. Maybe driving, stick shift, you drive a manual car. Maybe you play competitive Xbox and you want your thumb to be better at hitting, going back and forth between buttons. The idea here is that an artificial limb could learn with an amputee to meet the challenges and goals in their daily life. That the artificial limb could be a team. It could be a collaboration where the amputee can train their limbs. And uh, this is exactly the kind of thing we're working at right now at the Alberta Innovate Center for Machine Learning at the U of A. So we're, we're trying, to, trying to go into this domain. And what I'm going to show you next is just a very, very simple, tangible first step in that direction. It'll be a long time before we, we see these, these uh, high-level learning systems that I just described, but maybe we can have a first step in the right direction. So what I'm going to show you now is actually uh, a look inside the brain of my little robot co-presenter. So, to understand how a machine might learn, it's a good idea for us to maybe understand how a machine sees the world. It's quite a bit different than how we see it. And in the case of this little guy here, I would say that they learn in terms of little blinking lights. So this little robot here is learning in terms of, uh, in terms of he's seeing the world in terms of little tiny bits of information. So you can see actually up there on the screen how he has, uh, he has little tiny little specks of light. Now, that's how, his, how he's perceiving all those wiggly lines all of those, uh, those little fuzzy caterpillars you see on the screen there, those are the signals coming into the robot's world. Those are the signals that are actually coming into the robot about my body and about the things about his body himself. So things like the, the uh, angle of the elbow or the angle of the hand. And so what I'm showing you here is those tiny bits of information. Now, maybe that white bit at the top left over there, maybe that means that his head's getting pretty hot. And maybe the little white dot that just came on means his elbow is at a right angle. Well, the thing is, the robot doesn't have any of, that sort of, any of that semantics. It doesn't know that that bit means that thing. It has to learn what those pieces of information mean, and it learns that through its interactions with the environment. Um, so if we move on now, we want to think about how do, we go from, um, how do we go from all those tiny little pieces of information, those little sparks of light, how do we go from that into knowing stuff and things about the world, knowing something about an amputee? Okay, so in this case, I, I'm going to just take a step back and say that uh, while this is exciting, I'm showing you, you know, controlling a robot with my body, that's not the most exciting thing or the most beautiful thing I'm showing you today. What's really exciting is actually happening under the hood, inside the computer. So right now, while I'm interacting with this robot, it's learning about me. 
And in fact, it's been learning about me for the entire time that it's been plugged in right now, since the beginning of the presentation. Um, and that's what's really exciting. So how do we actually go from those bits of knowledge, those little tiny bits of, uh, sorry, those little bits of light, to knowledge, to knowing things? So as some of my colleagues at the Reinforcement Learning and Artificial Intelligence Lab at the U of A have, have posed, one way to learn things about the world, one way to build up knowledge, is to learn many, many tiny facts about the world and learn them in parallel all the time. And you know what? We don't want to stop learning them. We want to learn things thousands of times a second, every minute, all day, every day, all year. Why don't we learn little tiny facts about the world? And one way we can think about facts is about predictions. Maybe each of those little facts is a way of predicting the future, one little prediction about what's going to happen next. And so what I'm showing you here on screen right now is actually a, uh, is a set of those predictions. So the red line, I'm just going to show you, there's a, you can see like a solid red line, I hope, and that red line is showing you the actual angle of the robot's, of the robot's elbow. This is, this is pre-recorded data. Uh, and the little blue line is a prediction about what's going to happen. And so what's important here is that that little wiggly, fuzzy blue line, for the most part, goes up and down before the red line goes up and down. So this system has learned to predict the future. It's a tiny little prediction. It's a small prediction. It's saying, what's, going to my, what's my elbow going to do in, in the next two to three seconds? But you can build very powerful ideas out of very small predictions. I'm going to give you one simple example of this, and that's the case where, let's say your artificial limb is holding a cup of coffee and it's a hot cup of coffee, and it predicts that, you know, maybe that cup of coffee is going to start slipping. Well, it can change its behavior. It can grip maybe a little bit more tightly so that that cup of coffee doesn't land on someone's lap. That's an example of how predictions can do something powerful. So let's bring this back to the assistive devices of tomorrow. So remember our first goal. We wanted our assistive devices, our artificial devices, to restore function. We want them to replace function so that the replacement limb is someday as good as the one you lost. That's a noble goal, and a lot of people in, in both academia and industry are making great strides towards this. However, what comes next? What do we really want to do? And I would say that what we really want to do is to go beyond. So why, why stop at just replacing the function? Why don't we make the replacement better than the original? This is what I would like to see. Why don't we go beyond? Now, who, I think many of you know about it. Inspector Gadget. Anyone? Yeah, Inspector Gadget. Good. So why not make a go-go gadget arm? This is something I'm trying to convince my collaborators to be a wonderful idea. But let's make a go-go gadget arm. So remember the cooking example I gave you earlier? Remember I was saying you're stirring your tomato bisque? Maybe, maybe there's a bag of rice on the top shelf. And now your arm knows, OK, well, we're cooking. And, and uh, I, I know we need, we're going to be doing other cooking-related things. Now let's say you reach up for that top shelf. Now, I'm a short guy. I'd have to get a chair and step up on the chair and bring the rice down. But now maybe with the next generation limb, you reach out and the arm knows that because you're cooking, you want to telescope out. It, it goes all the way up and reaches that bag of rice on the top shelf. That's very, very cool. That's something that I think we might all really want. Yeah, I know. So as, uh, as Paul told us earlier, actually, we already have the ability to go beyond, beyond the status quo, the ability to become super abled. What I'd like to see is that in the days to come, amputees have the ability to exceed in ways we can only imagine. And while we're at it, why stop at medical devices? So why don't we apply these same kind of techniques, the power of thinking machines, to extend other areas of our technology, other areas where machines interact with us during our daily life? And so in this case, another man at the U of A who has some very big ideas is someone named Rich Sutton. So when Rich Sutton and I sit down to talk about this kind of thing, we talk about all sorts of things. Maybe a flight of little, like, helicopters that you control with your body to fly through your house and pick things up for you. Or, or maybe another little tiny limb that comes out of your shoulder and holds a teacup while you're playing piano or you're, you're uh, you know, you're working on the computer. I, I really, I've been wanting one of those for years. Or maybe, and this is a really wild idea, maybe even another lobe to your brain. That's right, a lobe to your brain that's tightly connected, jammed right in there. You have better memory. You can think better. You could compute the, I don't know, the square root of 729 in hexadecimal. I can't do that, but I need a machine to do it for me. The possibilities are endless. And so I would say that someday, and maybe someday soon, machine intelligence will allow us to amplify, to augment our human physical and mental abilities in a number of really impressive ways. And I would say, to some degree, they are, machines already have. Just look at the devices you use in everyday life. And so this brings me to perhaps the real and true reason why I don't have a smartphone. And that's the fact that 
offloading some of your control onto an intelligent device is kind of unsettling. And sometimes it's even really scary. When you think about it, you're giving a little tiny piece of your independence, a little tiny piece of your autonomy over to an intelligent machine or to an autonomous machine. And uh, that's something that requires trust. I can tell you, as someone who works with computers every single day, it takes a long time for me to build up true trust in the electronic devices I use. So I'm going to say this is going to require a lot of hard thought from, from individuals in society to see how we can build that trust in a safe way, in a responsible way, in a way that's actually wildly optimistic. So I think there are big things coming, and I think that machine intelligence will be at the heart of some of the great, best and greatest new discoveries that we see in the next few years. So machine intelligence opens up a number of doors for us. It gives us many, many options. Let's, let's choose what we do with our intelligent machines. So I'm not suggesting that thinking machines will give us the real tools of civilization. And by that, I mean things that we've heard from the other presenters today, things like compassion and empathy and perseverance. But you know what? Maybe it can get us in the right neighborhood. Maybe it can help point us in the right direction. We've seen that machine intelligence can already make life better for individual amputees. Maybe someday it'll give us all the tools to become truly marvelous humans.